a műsor támogatói. Az On The Spot stábjának munkáját a Szerencsejáték ZRT támogatja. Hogy a nagy tervek megvalósuljanak, ezért vagyunk itt. A műsor támogatója az Unicredit Bank. Az On The Spot előző évada a születésről szólt, szerte a világban. Arra voltunk kíváncsiak, hogy milyen hatással vannak a születésünk körülményei az életünkre. Közben pedig mi magunk is szülőkké váltunk. Most azért utazzuk körbe a világot már hármasban, hogy megtudjuk, vajon hogyan dolgozhatjuk föl legmélyebb gyerekkori traumáinkat. Olyan embereket kerestünk, akiknek nehezebben indult az életük, mint másoknak. Akik a 20. század legsötétebb pillanataiban jöttek a világra. Rosszkor voltak rossz helyen, amikor megszülettek. Ők voltak az ellenség gyermekei. Észak-Koreában, Vietnámban, Kambodzsában, Boszniában, vagy éppen Magyarországon. A szüleiket elhurcolták, kitelepítették, bebörtönözték, vagy meggyilkolták. A filmekből kiderül, hogy ezek a gyerekek hogyan maradtak életben, majd felnőttként mihez kezdtek a traumáikkal, és a csodával, hogy túlélték. Edith Éva Jéger 22 éves volt, amikor 1949-ben Kassáról emigrálva megérkezett Amerikába. Férjével és egy éves lányával Mariannával, pénz és nyelvtudás nélkül. Nem véletlenül az Egyesült Államokat választotta. 1945-ben amerikai katonák szabadították fel a Gunzkircheni náci koncentrációs táborban. A 40-es éveiben elvégezte a pszichológia szakot. Sikeres családterapeuta lett, szakterülete pedig a traumafeldolgozás. Ma is praktizál, 90 éves. I would like to go to Costco and uh, on Morena Boulevard in La Jolla, California. I mean, San Diego, California. All right, I was able to find an address here for you. Thank you. I'll hold that up for you right now. Is there anywhere else I can help you find today? That's fine. All right. Thank you for calling Destination Assist. Make sure you press the go to or enter button on the screen and have a great day today. You too, thank you. We came to America penniless, and I didn't have six dollars to get off the boat. So I had to be the survivor and become the breadwinner when I didn't speak a word of English to feed my child. I didn't have any time to think about anything. This is going to be like Hungarian cucumber salad that goes with the chicken paprika. You know, the Austro-Hungarian people were famous of wine, women, and songs. Is that working? So if you wanted to have a good time, if you were royalty, you went to Hungary. Oh, to I Budapest. see. 
I didn't think I had it in me. Yeah. Take this song that you you can nibble on it. Yeah? I'll do that. Okay. You don't want to do that. Okay. And I'm going to put like salt on this. Did your mother teach you how to do that? My mother taught me how to when do that. When you were a little kid? Yes. And she used her hands to do it? She used her hands to do it. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's great. Get it taken out. Thank you. Yes. you have it again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for dinner. Thank you. you know, it's one of the wonderful surprises at this time. I call it the evening time of my life, that I could find uh, a wonderful feeling of, uh, of youth and love and fun and being playful. And I think he provides that for me. And our relationship is the most kind, loving, pleasant uh, the relationship, even though we come from very different parts of the world and with very different philosophies. And somehow we manage to bring out the best in each other. My mother spent a lot of time alone in her marriage, and my father spent a lot of time with his cronies. And I spent a lot of time alone with my mother. I remember myself as being painfully shy, totally introverted. And that's why my mother introduced me to the opera, to literature, to Gone with the Wind. Those were very, very cherished times. I just wanted to practice five hours a day. I wanted to do the split in every which way, from the front, from the back. And I was uh, really just involved with uh, my gymnastic abilities. Could you please tell me about Kosha? I was a Hungarian and Jewish in Czechoslovakia when Kosice became Kosha in 1938. I remember my mother sitting at the radio, shaking, waiting for the news that finally we're going to be part of Hungary. The city was in celebration. My role was into dressing up in my Hungarian costume with a little red boots, with a little skirt, and then sing Chardash. became extremely, totally, very dedicated to become the best Hungarian. And when I heard the Hungarian anthem, I cried because my heart and soul was really in it. At the age of 10? Yes. I did not really know enough about Hungarian anti-Semitism. I only knew the good things. And what did you know about Horty back then? I was taught that he is a very lovely man. He is a kind, good man. And I was also taught that he was an admiral and that he was very knowledgeable and he's very wise. 
and all the good things, all the good things. That we are going to be in very good hands. That he's a knowledgeable leader. And I think he was. I think he was pulled in um, with lies and promises that never happened. I didn't think he was planning to kill the Jewish people. My parents had tickets to come to America, and they did not really believe that something like that would happen, ever. Turn your head towards the arm that is going up and reach the side of the bottom arm. Reach it back. Reach it back. Now I feel like you're opening the curtain. Open. Now reach your arm back. Now straighten your back. Stop here and come upright. Taking a deep breath. You're going to circle the leg out and around and bring it in. And good. Bring your leg in and around. And reach that leg up and over the bow. And Jewish people were not allowed to go out anymore. It was a most unfortunate, tragic moment in my life that in a way was worse than Auschwitz because that was my whole life and that was taken away from me. Just like that. That I was told by my trainer that I'm not qualified because I'm Jewish. And right away I said to her, I'm not Jewish. Where do you get that idea? She said that you are Jewish because when you were born and when you were registered, it said religion, Jewish. Even if you became anything else, you are picked up and you're not qualified because you were born a Jew. That's how. And if it didn't happen, what was ahead of you in gymnastics? What were your dreams? What were your Well, they talked about Olympics, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I was practicing every day, hours and hours. And that was really my life. And that was taken away and stolen away from me. Whew. Be careful, that's really hot. Okay. Now I have to put it back. He likes it right off the hook. He likes it medium rather. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm be 93. Edie will be 90 in about a month. And how did you fall in love? Slowly. I think if we're apart, we miss each other. But at this age, love is different than love 50 years ago or 60 years ago because the sexual part of love is non-existent. But the sweetness, the consideration, the fondness, 
the desire to be around another person. That is all what you do as an old person, call it love. It's real great. Makes you feel good. Edie is such a remarkable woman, understanding woman. She's been through so much herself. She probably has one of the sharpest minds I've ever run across in a woman. We were never told that we're going to Poland. There was no goodbye, there was no conversation. There was just standing in line, waiting for the man who is gonna show me, today it's referred to as a finger game. Whether you go this way or that way, life or death. When you reached uh, Dr. Mengele in the line, what did he say? He told me I'm going to see my mother soon. She's just going to take a shower when I followed my mom. I wanted to go with my mom. How did he know that she was your mom? Unfortunately, he asked, and I never could forgive myself. He asked, is she your sister or your mother? And I made a grave mistake. I said, it's my mother. Because they not only wanted to separate the numbers, but also parents and children. I was told. And I, I couldn't forgive myself that maybe my mother would be still alive. We put things in our heads, honey. Don't even ask for anything logical, rational. I was beaten in Auschwitz, too, by a fellow prisoner who became a couple. That was the first day when I arrived. She, she, she pulled my earrings out, and I said, I was going to give it to you. And she said, you were, you were going to the theater while I was rotting here. And when I asked her, when will I see my mother, she said she's burning there, pointing at the chimney. My sister was there, and she hugged me. And I never forget what she said. You know what she said? The spirit never dies. That's how I entered Auschwitz. I think the ballet master saved my life because he picked me up and I did a back bend on his hands and he said to me that God built uh, me in such a magnificent way. For the minden, minden ecstasy, um, ecstasy, minden ami, ami gyönyörű és jó jön belőled ki. Nem, nem kívülről be. És adott nekem egy olyan, olyan érzést, hogy én szép vagyok, mert a lelkem szép. Ne hallgassak azokra, akik engem nem szeretnek. És ez segített nekem Auschwitzba, mikor mondták nekem, hogy én meg fogok itt halni, és csak az, azért vagyok itt, hogy dolgozzak. És azt hallottam minden nap, és én itt vagyok. Szóval so, nem tudtak nekem megölni 
a lelkemet. És mondták, hogy Tibor meghalt egy évvel ezelőtt, az ő barátjuk volt, jó barátja Tiborra, de most jött be paciens, úgyhogy muszáj mennem mostan jó élete. Hívlak, jó életkén. Tibi meghalt egy évvel ezelőtt életkén. Igen, for sure. Ilyes életem, nagyon drága ember volt. Téged is áldja meg az Istenke. Love you, Magdiska. Hi. Well, hello. Hello, <laughs> honey, I'm so happy that you came. Hi, honey, are you hungry, thirsty? Um, no, I'm good. I think, you know, ever since I stopped the cancer stuff, I mean, yeah. I'm kind of rattling around in the house by myself. And, you know, I had Jane for a while. We go out a lot, but now she has a boyfriend. So that's <laughs> the end of that, you know. And I've, I have friends I do things with, but it's just, it doesn't feel, I don't know, I feel like I'm just sort of going through the motions. I'm just trying to figure out what my purpose is. So your PTSD is that you had cancer, you survived the cancer, but now you may get up in the morning and you don't say what, you say what for. And this is what we refer to as the existential vacuum. A depression has to do with feeling helpless, feeling hopeless, mm -hmm. and above all, feeling worthless, that I don't have value. And if you survive today, then you can be free, so you, you're here looking at the head of you. You know, it's easy. Thing, it? I've been trying to get out of it for years, you know? And that journey comes with a lot of pain and a lot of grief and a lot of, lot of rage because there is no forgiveness without the rage. And the only unconditional love that you get is a place called home. Now, if you didn't get it, your childhood ended and you grieve over your childhood that you never had. Yeah, but that's gone. <laughs> yeah. We're not playing yes, but. No more yes, but. Just say, yes, I survived it. I somehow was the most brilliant little survivor because I'm here today. Mm -hmm. So do you see? If what you did do, not what you didn't do, because it's easier to die than to live. Right. I know people died in Auschwitz. It's been documented, especially poor children who always waited for somebody to come, and was nobody. Right. The more externally oriented you are, the more depressed you're going to be, because dependency can breed depression. Mm. Uh, that might and be part of my problem. <laughs> no problem. It's a, it's a challenge. It's in the second page. I would rather be with someone tonight, but being here alone is okay. That's right. Just because I'm alone now doesn't mean I'll always be alone. You got it. I care about myself. There are people who care about me. Yeah. And name them. Edie. Name them Edie. <laughs> there are activities that I enjoy alone. List them. Yeah. Everybody gets lonely at times, even married people. <laughs> no, that one. Just because this man or woman has rejected me doesn't mean they all will. So what can I do? How do I talk to myself? 
because that changes your body yeah, chemistry. Yeah, right. That I'm here with myself, and you know what is pretty good company. <laughs> In fact, the best I ever had. Mm -hmm. That's how you talk to yourself. But what did you just say? I'm here by myself, and that's the best company. Company. That's right. I'm gonna write that down. Yes. <laughs> yes. No guilt. No worry. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to call me with yes. a yes about when we have talked? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I was working okay. with two Vietnam veterans, and one of them was angry and was cursing everything and everyone, God and country. And the other one says to me, you know, Doc, I am so grateful that I can sit in a wheelchair and I can see my children's eyes, and I can see the flowers closer. And I'm sitting there in a white coat, it says Dr. Eager, Department of Psychiatry, and I feel like a biggest imposter. Hi, honey. Because I haven't done my work, and there is no way I can take them further than I have gone myself. Yeah, here it is, honey. Where were you? dealing with your trauma back then? I still was in denial. And I still kept running and thinking that the more I study, the more pieces of paper I pick up, then I'm going to somehow earn that I not only had survivor's guilt, I had survivor's shame. So when I graduated cum laude, I never showed up for my graduation because I said to myself, I'm too old and I made it and they are dead. That I did not give myself permission to celebrate the hard work of going to school and graduating with honors. If I tell you Mengele, what is, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Fear. Uncontrollable. Because it's Unexplainable. Not... Feeling of never knowing what's going to happen next. When I saw his eyes, his, those eyes are so piercing. I, I'll show you a picture of him later. Yeah, so you can show it. You, you can show go to my office. Go to my office and look across under the window, and there is a picture there. When he came to the barrack and he wanted to be uh, entertained and he wanted to know who are the people who can entertain him, my friends pushed me in front of him. He didn't ask me. So while I was dancing for Dr. Mangala, I closed my eyes and I pretended that the music was Tchaikovsky. And I was dancing the Romeo and Juliet at the Budapest Opera House. That's what I did. I checked out. No way to really have any kind of understanding that the same person who annihilated my family grabbed me and threw me on the other side. And that kept going in my mind over and over and over again.
that why did I deserve to survive? I heard that Mengele was in Paraguay and he got married. And, and I pictured myself going and interview him as a journalist from America. And then I was going to tell him that I'm the one who danced for you. That was in my fantasy. That's life. That's what all the people say. You're riding high in April, shot down in May. But I know I'm going to change that tune. When I'm back on top, back on top in June, I said that's life. And as funny as it may seem, some people get their kicks stomping on a dream. Good, and now the last clue. Stuffed with cheese, these Jewish pancakes have been sautéed to a golden brown. Blintzes. Those are blintzes. Emily, a big lead for you. In 1981, Ananda Chakrabarti received a patent for a life form made of just one this. Emily? What is a cell? Cell is right. 20th century 600. Where did you get this movie short, Teddy? Mert van illak, hogy az agyamat kicsit meggen gyakorlatta, hogy, hogy tudom -e a válaszokat. Szóval, hogy szeretem, hogyha tudom a válaszokat. It represents strength and courage. What is the eagle? Be more specific. Where's the bald eagle? That's it, yes. Eddie, mikor vált Amerikai jövő? Soha. Én úgy érzem magam, hogy én a világhoz tartozom. It's, it's religious not to give myself any labels, just to accept that I'm no more and no less than a human being. I saw the American people as being very kind, very much caring for the poor. Um, and and yet I found out that there was prejudice even in America when I worked in a factory and I was not allowed to go to a bathroom because that was for colored people. And that's when I realized that after Nazi Germany, communist Russia, here I am in America, and I see prejudice. And I was always told not to go to the colored bathroom. So I always went to the colored bathroom. You already know that. And I pretended that I don't speak English. I, I knew right away what was going on. And that's so... There is no perfect anything. Desmond Tutu Nobel laureate, one of those rare and eternal stories that leave you forever changed. Desmond Tutu, jaj, Istenem, jaj, de is akkor fogok sírni, fogok sírni. Jaj, Istenem, de, de, jaj, Istenem, kérdés neki. 
Yeah, right there, yeah. This is the death march from Mauthausen to Gurkirchen. Gurkirchen was the last place where I was liberated. Hunger. Hunger is my only name. Every part of me is in pain. Every part of me is numb. I can't walk another step. I ache so badly. I can't feel myself move. I am just a circuitry of pain. I don't know that I have stumbled until I feel the arms of Magda and the other girls lifting me. They have laced their fingers together to form a human chair. You shared your bread, one of them says. The words don't mean a thing to me. When have I ever tasted bread? But then a memory rises up. Our first night at Auschwitz, Mengele ordering me music and Mengele ordering me to dance. This body danced. This mind dreamt of the opera house. This body ate the bread. Mengele killed my mother. Mengele let me live. Now a girl who shared a crust with me nearly a year ago has recognized me. She uses her last strength to interlace her fingers with Magda's and lift me up into the air. In a way, Mengele allowed this moment to happen he didn't kill any of us that night or any night after that. He gave us bread. Life is a collection of memories. It's part of my life. Not the better part was left in Auschwitz, but part of me was left in Auschwitz, yes. Yeah. Not the better part. Part of you was I left. will never forget never forget or overcome, but I came to terms with it. I made somehow, in some way, a peace so I can live a full life and I have joy and passion. Auschwitz was an opportunity to discover, to discover those skills that I never thought was possible. And I talk to God every day, every day, that this is temporary. And if I survive today, then I'm going to see my boyfriend, that I can see the light. Never, ever I thought of staying in Auschwitz, never considered the possibility for me dying, that I have to get through this. So I had a part in me that nobody could touch. And no Nazi could touch that. Maybe can I ask you about going back to Auschwitz? It was a very, very important time of my life, and I'm very grateful that I was able to do that. I saw the barracks where I danced for Dr. Mengele. When I was able to touch that place, touch that place, not just talking about that, what happened, I didn't even realize how important it was for me to go back to that place and see it and feel it and experience it. So not just remembering, but revisiting that place and reliving that experience and, of course, not to get stuck in there. Not to get stuck in there. My sister Magda was uh, who's very precious and tells you everything the way she feels, and she told me that I'm truly an idiot for doing that. She thought that that's something that happened a long time ago, and why go back? 
why go and re-experience such a hell? Because we were in hell, but we're back. You know, so why don't I just appreciate living today? Eddie, álmodott valamikor ilyen életről? Soha. Soha. Nem? Soha. Ez egy olyan boldogság, hogy ezt elértem. Sok munkával, sok munkával, és a, a munka az olyan jó, olyan, olyan jó. Úgy kielégíti a lelkemet, hogy én ezt tudom csinálni. Nem csak, hogy én átéltem, de segítek másoknak, hogy ők, ők is tudják az életet élvezni és szeretni. starting to say something and then I said keep I hear your company. feelings I hear your I, I hear your pain okay okay I love you more. yeah yeah I was I was I'm trying to remember what you what you okay. said and I, I said, love you more. yeah see you cannot allow her to attack you and you defend it yeah you must not ever defend or apologize is that way she will control me. I'll see you in heaven. Okay. okay. Call me every well, time. I will, I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. Love you. <laughs> hey, Gamma. Okay. Hi. Hi, I'm Sue Helens. I'm a guest today. I'm Edie Eager. Edie, nice I to meet you. I am the other Edie. Robin Gershman. Hello. 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 You're the organizer. Yes, Marianne. My mother has a really good friend named Edie Schroeder, and she has been asking my husband to do this for many years. And finally, this year, the timing was right. And Edie has a investment group, and this is the investment group. And so they meet, I think, once a month, maybe, and talk about their investments. They all put money in, and they have a portfolio, and they talk about what's going on in the market. So they've asked Rob to give some insight as to his thoughts about what's happening in the world today, um, as far as the investment climate, and also talk about his research. Uh, so that's why we're here. Um, this is Dr. Robert F. Engel III and his wife, Mary Ann, Dr. Mary Ann Engel, and Mary Ann's mother, Dr. Edith Eva Eager, uh, whose book has been published. Uh, Dr. Engel received the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2003. He's an expert in time series analysis of financial markets and is an advisor to international governments on his expertise. The first thing you'll see is this map. It's a forecast of the volatility today of the stock markets in each of these countries. And green means that the market volatility is low relative to what it's been historically, and red means it's high relative to what it's been historically. This is November 8th. This is election day. So this is the forecast of what the volatility would be in the whole world on the day we had our last election. Then. Here's what happened a couple days later. There's a lot of red in the world, a lot of surprise, but it's not everywhere. I mean, China and Russia are not red. Uh, actually, most of Europe is green. Interestingly, the US is green. 
So we have From wonderful Andrew. looking Hungarian reds. Yeah. Okay. All right. This, Excuse me, Mom. Oh, she's telling a joke. She's telling a joke. Give oh, sorry. Her, okay. Finish your joke. Oh, yeah. We're all on the joke. edge of our chair. Okay. Finish the joke. <laughs> they go to the rabbi and they complain because their in-laws moved in and everything is very, 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 very crowded. Yeah. And the rabbi said, do you have any animals? And said, yeah, it's in the barn. Oh, well, go. Go to the barn and get the animals and bring them in, and I'll see you in one month. But Rabbi, wait. A rabbi spoke. They come back in a month. How is it? Oh, it's terrible. Go put back the animals in the barn and come back in a month. They come back. How is it? Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> we have my mother's chicken paprika. We have asparagus with quail's eggs and capers. We have the most delicious dumplings ever. And we have a delicious cucumber salad, which I love. So I think it's easiest. I know it's kind of a mess, but anyway, if you, if you don't mind getting up and getting your food. We actually prefer served. <laughs> <laughs> we, the survivors, became parents. See, I became a mother when I needed a mother. Everything was upside down. See? I didn't know how to be a mom. I needed a mom. When Marian came home from school, I didn't know anything about how to listen or how to validate feelings. I, compassionate listening, that was not in my lexicon. So she comes home and cries that she was not invited to a birthday party. So what do I do? I, I call the defense mechanism, minimize it. Well, that's not a big deal, honey. Why don't you come to the kitchen? Because I just baked a seven-layer chocolate cake, and I'm going to make you a chocolate milkshake. See? That's what I did. Well, she, she made it in spite of me. She's a brilliant child psychologist now. She has an office on Park Avenue in New York. I think it's in my book, When My Granddaughter Was Born. The pediatrician examined her and said, this little girl is very flexible. She might become a ballerina. And I said to the pediatrician, now I can die because now my blood is in her. He just looked at me like, you know, didn't know what I was talking about. But sure enough, Lindsay became a little ballerina. I saw the Nutcracker Suite 10 million times. But when she went to a wonderful school, Bishops, and she asked me to buy her a dress so she can go to dance, in her school, and I do buy the dress, and I come home, and out of the blue, I am crying. What is that all about? I just bought Lindsay a dress. And it took me a while to acknowledge that I'm not crying because Lindsay went to a dance. I cried because I never went to a dance. And that's the work I do. To grieve over not what happened, but what didn't happen. And I think that's a good question for every one of us to ask. When did your childhood end? The other question is, which is very good, by the way, would you like to be married to you? Think about that. <laughs>
Glenn Miller's in the movie. Yes. Have we, now, have is that what they right. played before here? Early in the evening. Well, they we may have had played a request that for a wolf. Yeah. But I will double check at the break. And if they haven't played it, they yes. will yeah, we, play it. We okay? Like yeah, it's yes. nice to have that. All right. I will From do World War II days. Absolutely. This, yes. This is back in those days. And I was liberated by the Americans in oh. 1945. And I played, I learned how to dance from In the Moon. At one the moon and I Az On The Spot technikai partnere a 220 volt webáruház. A műsort a DM Drogiri Márt támogatja. Unikum. Csak pozitívan. Az On The Spot stábjának munkáját a Szerencsejáték ZRT támogatja.